Good morning, everyone. It's 11, finally, and we can continue. All right, so let me just check quickly. Yeah, I started recording. That's also recording. Yeah. Um, so today, we will uh, most likely, okay, I will try uh, to finish this chapter four. Uh, and probably from the next class, we will start discussing oscillations. Oscillations of one object or one body, not a, a coupled oscillations. Coupled oscillations will be closer to the end of the semester. But today, uh, we will still uh, be talking about energies. Right. Um, and yeah, I need to start grading your homework, right? Um, just keep begi beginning of the semester kind of very hectic, and then I had a uh, first midterm exam on physics too. So, um, you were saying something? Excuse me, professor. Yeah, I just have a question about the exam. At the, when is it? Okay, as I said already a couple of times, usually we don't have. Okay, I don't have exact dates for a classical mechanics exam, right? Oh, it's a small class, we can every time negotiate, discuss when you are available, when you don't have any other uh, exams. So, usually it's after this chapter, after chapter 4, all right? So, I assigned two homework. The first uh, energy homework is due, I think, this Thursday, all right? And the second will be in a week. So, basically, most likely the, <coughs> the midterm exam, the first one, will be like in a couple of weeks. Most likely. And then when we get closer, we will, we will talk about that. Right. To, make the, the, to make sure that you don't have two exams on the same day, right? So it's a small class we can, we, we can negotiate. It's not like physics 1 or physics 2 when you have 300 students, right, or 400, right? So approximately a couple of weeks, usually like a week after the uh, homework number 4, right? Okay? I hope I answered. Right. Um, so let's back to uh, let's get back to our example, which is uh, four point seven. Example four point seven. Right. Uh, probably should have written. So again, it's not a problem. It's an example from the book four point seven. Uh, you remember what we introduce all energy tools, right? In general, first, which can be applied for any system. Uh, and then we decided to slightly adjust them uh, and start applying for one-dimensional system, right? And so, as a result, we introduced three remarkable features, right, of the first, of a one-dimensional system. So, the first one uh, was, uh, it's easier to identify if a force is conservative or not, right? So, uh, if... Condition number one is satisfied. If a force is the function of a position only, then the second condition is automatically satisfied, right? So you don't have to prove um, that uh, work is path independent. But again, it's only for one dimensional system, right? It doesn't matter, linear or curved linear, right? Uh, second remarkable feature, if you plot potential energy, again, of one dimensional system, uh, if you plot potential energy versus position, it can be angle, like in this case, it can be position, right? Uh, then you can easily uh, analyze, quickly analyze behavior of the system. So that you can look at that as if it was a picture of a roller coaster, right? So you can, uh, you can easily get the direction of the forces, uh, points of stability, and stabi uh, instability, right? Plenty of interesting information. And the last, the third remarkable feature was that for one-dimensional system, using energy approach, basically using conservation of mechanical energy, you can still get a function of motion. You can get a function, equation of motion, right? So which would describe a position of a, a system at any moment of time. Because usually that's the disadvantage of uh, using energy approach. You can get the value of something at a particular point faster. But as a result, you're losing the whole history. You're losing all the trees and flowers along the road, right? So you're just getting to the final point very quickly, like by a plane. But 
you're losing the beauties, right, on the way uh, to get there. Right. So we introduced these three remarkable features <coughs> and started looking at this example, which is basically uh, you have, okay, we have a cylindrical surface. I use my box of cramps, right, uh, and a box. On top of that cylinder, we have a box, right, at this, at, at, at this, at, at, at above, right. And so we need to um, discuss the stability of this point when the box right um, at this point, right. Theta equals zero, of course, I will show that angle, right. So it, when is it stable and when it is unstable, right. And I think we, uh, we drew diagram like this, right. And we also identified forces and discuss them quickly, right? And that's where we stop. So what? Uh, we have a surface, cylindrical surface, and of course, with plenty of roughness, right? So that uh, this uh, cube can uh, sort of like a rock, right? Can oscillate uh, above this point, right? So there must be plenty of uh, friction force. Uh, and so all the forces, first, course, conservative force. So this object, again, we discuss the motion of the cube. That's our object. And of course, in the presence of this external force, that is an external conservative force. And it is conservative because it's a basically function of a position only one dimensional system. Okay, it doesn't have a function of, of a position, but it's a special case of a dependence. Right. So uh, mg is conservative. As a result, we can introduce potential energy, right? Uh, mg y, mg uh, h, right? I use h. Uh, which h? We will see. Static friction, <clears throat> and uh, since uh, when it rocks, when it moves uh, on the surface, there is no sliding point of contact. Uh, doesn't slide. As a result, work done by the friction force is zero. Friction force is basically in this case, uh, it's a force. It's a force of constraints, right? It it provide it's. Uh, it prevents uh, block from sliding. And then normal force. Again, it's a force of constraints. It just guarantees that uh, our cube is on the cylindrical surface. That's its role, right? It's just this and this force, they just give us sort of like a trajectory of, a, uh, of this uh, box, right, cube. And again, normal force, since it's perpendicular to possible, all the possible sliding, uh, so work done is zero. So basically these two forces, and again I emphasize forces of constraints. These two forces of constraints, since their works are zero, so they don't play our game. They cannot change energy, right? As a result, we can just simply just ignore them, right? And again, after this example, we will, I will mention another example, and we will sort of generalize the statement about forces of constraints, right? But in this case, you see, we can just basically forget about them, right? So then, next, uh, so obviously, we just need to analyze uh, behavior. We just need to write down expression for the potential energy in order to analyze behavior of this uh, system. And so we introduce potential energy. So as a result, we need to show the reference level. It's up to you where to position it. You, you, you can position it here. You can position it, I know, at the top of the box when it's in equilibrium, right? But I don't think that that is the best point. I think in this case, the best point is at the uh, center of the cylinder, cylindrical surface, cylindrical surface. Right. So let me uh, draw some uh, blue line. So that's my U equals zero. So that's the reference point. A uh, level, right? Reference level in our case. Right? Okay, so then how can we uh, calculate potential energy of a rigid object? Again, I feel like um, we haven't derived that. Um, I still, I still keep promising myself maybe to assign it as a homework, but I already assigned it. Anyway, you know from uh, from honors uh, class that if you want to find potential energy of a rigid object, you need to uh, create a fake particle position at the center of mass, which has a mass of the total rigid object. And one, if you find the potential energy of that fake mass, 
that's the potential energy of uh, the whole rigid object. So basically, we just need to keep track of uh, the center of mass point and find its position relative to the reference level and h, h, it's a distance from the reference level to the position of the center of mass. Of course, when the uh, cube is displaced from the equilibrium. So you see I drew dash line position of the cube in the equilibrium. And of course, we need to discuss that stability. And then we displace it from the equilibrium, right? And now uh, we need to uh, show that uh, parameter which can be used to define uh, motion of this system, right? So parameter is, I think it's more or less obvious, right? It's uh, this angle theta. Of course, it's not unique. You can introduce any other parameter. You can introduce angle phi instead of theta. Maybe you can uh, even just uh, define position uh, and motion of this object by uh, using this height between the center of mass point and the uh, and the reference point, and the reference level, it's it's up to you which parameter to use. But of course, in this case, I think the 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 best is this angle theta, right, which defines displacement from the point which we want to analyze on stability. <clears throat> right. So it's a one-dimensional system. So we have a single parameter. So theta is our parameter. And so as a result, uh, since it's a one, and we will see, we will be able to write potential energy in terms of only this theta. Right. So it's, uh, it means that this system is one dimensional. So it's a one dimensional system. <coughs> right. Okay, so now uh, let's start drawing, continue drawing, continue drawing. So we just need to again find H, basically, that's what we need. So we need to find H so that we can write potential energy. Maybe I should frame it so that's the beginning, right? MM, it's the mass of the cube, we assume. So <clears throat> um, this, uh, the center of mass point when the cube is in the equilibrium. And of course, the center of mass point must be above the point of contact. Right, so this point of contact, of course, in the middle, right, and the center of mass uh, is over there. So let me label it as C. So that is the center of mass when the cube is in the equilibrium. But we displaced it, so of course the center of mass will be in a different position. And, but still it will be above the uh, center of the cube. So let's say this is the center of the cube. So this, this point of contact, right, moved over here. Right. So let me label them somehow. So let's say this is point, if this point of contact A, then new point, uh, I mean, the point of, this point of contact will move to this place when the cube moves. Right. So the center of mass C will be just above this point. So I need to, I need to just draw a line parallel to the sides. <coughs> okay, so now and I will use dash line. All right, so somewhere over here, there will be center of mass, new position of the center of mass. Maybe I'll use blue. Right? So this will be, um, where should I write it? Um, okay, C prime. So this point C moves to this point, to, uh, C point moves to uh, that position. So center of mass, C. So we just need to find distance from this point to this ref uh, to the reference level. So that's what this is our age, right? And uh, before I show the distance which we need to find, let me draw uh, a few auxiliary lines, some additional lines. I want to draw this line. You see this uh, R, this uh, radius, right? And I just want to extend it. And of course, this line must be parallel to this line. Because again, this is 90 degrees, right? It's the center of mass. And of course, since this is the point of contact, this is the tangent line, this is the radial line. So of course, this must be also 90 degrees. So this line and that line must be parallel to each other. So let me draw it. Right. 
and of course parallel to the sides of the cube. Okay, so now <coughs> I want to draw a few additional lines. Um, I want to draw uh, this, okay, let me draw this horizontal line. Um, yeah, yeah, let me draw this horizontal line. And also, uh, let me draw uh, a line which is perpendicular to this line, from this point, from the center of mass, perpendicular to that. You know what? Yeah. Something like this. And now let me label these points, because we need to keep track of them. So, let me uh, now let me draw also the height, and then I will label points. All right, so the height which we need to find is this. Right, so, and now let me label. So, you see, I just draw a straight line which goes through this point, right, intersection of this line and that small short line. And now let me label all the points. So, I think I labeled this as uh, K this point as B, this point as what? M. M. Then, this point of contact, which we label it D prime. You know what? No, let me uh, draw it, write, write D prime over here. So, this will be D prime. Right. Uh, then, which, what else I might need? Um, no, I think it's, I think that should be enough. Ah, yeah, point this O, right. the center. Okay, now it looks like the diagram is, um, it's all here. Now we just need to look carefully and write what we need, and write, uh, and find this distance. <coughs> and so H, let me show that this H is basically KM. Km, and uh, of course Km, it's a Kb plus Bm. So it will be Kb plus Bm. Right. So let's first find Kb and then Bm. So Kb. <coughs> okay, let me put Kb and question mark and steps which we need to make in order to find this. First of all, look, because of this static friction, of course, there is no sliding, right? No sliding, no slipping. So it means that uh, this distance, I mean, this arc length, you see this, equals to this distance. Right? Because this point A prime, it's a point, it was a point of contact at the equilibrium, right? So it means that this arc length must be equal to that distance. Of course, my picture is slightly distorted. It looks like this arc length is longer. But <clears throat> I've never been to art school. But you see that these two uh, distances must be uh, the same. So let me write, so since there is no uh, sliding, Right. Okay, let me write just no sliding in. So uh, no uh, sliding means that uh, this distance a d arc length equals to a prime d prime or uh, a d prime. A d prime equals to a prime d prime. Right. And can we find this? A d prime is just this arc length. Theta is in radians. Well, we can easily find it. So it's r times theta. So it is equal to r times theta. Okay, so it means that uh, this, because of the construction c prime b, this c prime b equals to a prime d prime and also equals to r theta. So this C prime B, C prime B equals to 
by the construction a prime d prime a prime d prime and it will be equal to r theta it's just a simple geometry so which uh, we just need to carefully uh, we just need to carefully go through so now as a result over here so this is r theta okay let me emphasize so this is r theta then angles now we need to connect this angle uh, find one of these angles and relate it with this one so first you can look at this big triangle right this one right if this is theta this will be 90 degrees so this angle will be 90 minus theta right so this angle is 90 minus theta and then if you look at the triangle this one c prime b okay this point is not labeled so if this is 90 minus theta this is 90 and then this angle is theta it's simple geometry right so this angle is also okay maybe i use i should use red emphasize so this angle will be also theta by geometry right I use that argument you can come up with different triangles in order to prove that and that that angle is theta as well and now if this side is r theta this angle theta we should be able to, we should be able to find that angle easily i mean this side is uh, easily because it's opposite to the angle theta so this kb will be r theta time times sine of that angle theta okay half uh is done so now i can write so from the triangle uh, C prime B K, I can write that uh, K B equals to R theta times uh, sine of our angle theta. So that's K B written in terms of what is given R and the single parameter theta which we still believe the system is one dimensional but once we can show that uh, we can write potential energy in terms of a single parameter that's basically the proof so now uh, the rest bm now bm okay this is easier uh, because look this distance O d prime we know it's just r then this distance from d prime to b this distance d prime b it's a half of the side of our cube the side of the cube is 2b right? because again you see by the construction this is the center of mass center of mass is at the center so this is b this is b and because of the construction the way we, we draw this we, before we the way we created this point B, we just draw the line perpendicular or parallel to that side. So it means that this B D prime is also B. So um, B D prime is B. So as a result, O B is O B is R plus B. So this is R plus B, and now we need to find this side. So right triangle, this one. So will be so BM will be uh, this times. Okay, this is angle. Let me also move this angle theta, right? Obviously, so it will be a cosine of that angle. So that side times cosine of that angle. So as a result, I can uh, write BM bm equals to r plus b this hypotenuse right basically uh, times cosine of the angle cosine theta okay so we almost uh, went through this mass of geometry right. okay so now we can uh, basically we know h it's uh, uh, that kb plus bm this so and we can write potential energy so we are ready to write down potential energy right uh, so u equals mg and uh, k 
KB. Probably I will write, uh, I just want to see which one I wrote first. Let me write this first. So it will be R plus B cosine theta and then plus R theta sine of theta. Right. So that's our potential energy. So we can frame it because it's a, a crucial point. Because after that, it's just a calculus. But after, up to this point, yeah, up to this point, it's a geometry. After this point, it's a calculus. Nice physics problem, right? The physics was basically probably over here only at the very beginning when we analyzed forces. The rest is, again, as I said, first a geometry, and then after that, just a calculus. All right. Um, so, after this, uh, of course, we can, for example, use our uh, second remarkable feature. The first remarkable feature we used over here to identify that this force is a conservative force. Now we can, uh, if, we, if you plot potential energy versus theta, defines position, we can uh, quickly analyze behavior of the system and then we can answer the question if this point theta equals zero uh, is stable or unstable and under which conditions. Okay, I did. Uh, I, I picked some numbers for R and B, plotted, right? Uh, and, but you can actually even, um, if you carefully, care, carefully rock some small objects uh, on this, on the, uh, at the top of this cylinder, right? Or bigger object and try to follow the center of mass, you can see what I'm going to draw now on the graph, on the plot. Because basically, look, potential energy, it's mg, some constant, times this distance, h, right? And if you put a dot at the center of mass, right, on the sort of, on, the, on those boxes, right? And you can just see what happens to that point, right? When it goes up or when it goes down, right? And so on, you can, you can follow it right. <clears throat> with your eyes, actually. So now, uh, as I said, now let's, let's uh, use... And again, it's sort of like a conceptual, right? Using that second remarkable feature, it's, it helps conceptually to see uh, what happens to the system and analyze the system. But of course, if you want to be, uh, if you want to get into the details, of course, you need to look at the first derivative, second derivative, and we will do it. We will do it. So now we can use. Okay, let me put a small bullet. Use the uh, that second remarkable feature. So, plotting. And I plot it, uh, let's first for uh, when radius of the cylindrical surface. First I look, okay, less than B. Let's look at that. So basically it's uh, this system when you have cylindrical surface and the box is larger. The size of the box is larger than uh, the cylindrical surface. And if you, <clears throat> again, you, as I said, you can just uh, take some numbers <clears throat> and plot it. And uh, I got this. So let's say you can, yeah, it's a U versus, uh, theta. <clears throat> So this point, this point maximum, when theta equals to zero, it will be just mg, <coughs> and this h will be what? Just r, and plus this distance, uh, which is the half of the size of the cube. So it's a r plus b, right? So it will be this point is just um, mg r plus b. <coughs> And it's a maximum point. And then branches will go down. So you will see something like this. Right? I wouldn't say it's parabola, right? I don't know, because uh, you just need to 
<coughs> dependence is kind of more complicated, right? So, but you will see in this case if you plot uh, and uh, you, you see that it's unstable point, right? Unstable point. All right, so force over here, of course, acts this way, driving the system away from the equilibrium. Uh, uh, over here, force uh, will act this way. Right? You remember in the previous class we were discussing this. So here, force, here, force. <coughs> so as a result, uh, that system is on system under the, with these conditions when R is less than B is unstable. Right. Now let's look at the case when uh, R is larger than B. Right. So now it will be like a box. I use my box of my shade cream, right? Sort of this situation. <coughs> So if I plot now, you know what, let me reduce this size over here. Okay. So U versus theta. Again, this point will be still at the same level, MGR plus B. All right, so this will be. Okay, let me just show that this is also MGR plus B. And now we will have this picture. So first like this, and then it goes. Of course, it must be symmetrical. So now we have three stationary points uh, when, okay, I, I didn't try that. It's uh, for the case when R is larger <clears throat> than B. So now we have three stationary points. And in this case, theta equals zero, this is zero. Theta equals zero, it looks like will be a sta uh, stable point, right? And this stationary point, let's call it theta one, and this point, stationary point, minus theta one because of the symmetry of those <clears throat> two additional stationary points of the same values, but positive and negative. So those are not stable. And so you see this is stable, of course, if, uh, if, uh, you <clears throat> if the total mechanical energy that you provide to the system is not that large. Because you see this, we have potential well, and if you provide enough of, uh, if, if you provide uh, too much of total mechanical energy, of course, your system will be able to roll over that hill, right, and <laughs> go into, this, into, into its destruction, right? But if you provide a small amount of uh, total mechanical energy, yeah, it can rock, it can oscillate uh, around the stable equilibrium point, right? <coughs> it's uh, like this, if you have uh, R larger than B, right? So if you provide a small amount of energy, yeah, it oscillates. But if you provide too much, okay, okay you see I already, <coughs> it ran over uh, that hill. Right. Then, uh, what are these, uh, what's the physical meaning of these stationary points theta 1? Again, we just, uh, sort of like a conceptual analysis. When uh, we have a cube, size of the cube smaller than the size of the cylindrical surface, look, just follow it. All right, so first it uh, oscillates like this, and then at a certain moment, you see we have this corner, this, co this corner of the cube and this corner of the cube, right? So no later, at a certain angle, of course, that corner uh, will reach the surface of the cylindrical surface, and this uh, cube will start moving around that corner. Basically, that's the reason why we have, we're, we're getting maximum over there. Because when it starts uh, sort of like moving around this corner, the center of mass starts moving up. And the same on this side, right? So when it reaches this uh, corner of the cube, it starts moving around that corner, right? Giving us maximum point and then phew, object goes into the abysmal abyss. But, but, why we don't have these 
maxima on this picture because when the size of the cube is larger than the size of the box, the size of the cylindrical surface, in that case, if it starts ro uh, moving this way, right, it doesn't reach this corner. It starts sliding. It reaches basically this perpendicularity, uh, a free fall before before it can reach this corner, this uh, this uh, this corner of the cube. That's why we are not getting this maximum points. And the same on this side, right? So if you um, displace it too much, right? So yeah, it still cannot reach uh, this corner and it starts sliding. But if the cube is small, yes, it can reach this corner of the cube and starts moving around that corner, right? So that's the <coughs> sort of conceptual explanation just by looking at the examples, right? And graph uh, can show you that. But again, that's conceptual analysis but we still want to get into the gory details. So as a result, it means that we need to analyze the first derivative, the second derivative, in order to get all this mathematically. Right? But still, it's nice to uh, look at, uh, um, at the system uh, from this conceptual point of view and explain the physical meaning of those uh, new maxima so yeah, we um, discussed that, and now I will put a new bullet. So now, <coughs> uh, let's calculate. Okay. So now, let's actually calculate. First, we need to find stationary points. First derivative. All right, so first stationary points. Um, so du over d theta must be equal to zero, right? Stationary points. <coughs> Maybe I will first write so stationary points. So it will be mg, then, okay, <coughs> let me use the square bracket. Okay, I will probably start differentiating that one. So it will be R sine theta, then uh, plus R <coughs> uh, theta cosine theta. So it's that term. And then only this, because the minus will pop up, and I don't like negative number, negative uh, terms at the very beginning. Just minor compulsion. So it will be minus... Uh, R plus B uh, sine theta. Right. Okay, so some, something should be canceled. This term and that term gets canceled. R sine theta minus R sine theta. And so it must be equal to zero. As a result, uh, mg goes. So we will have sine over cosine, it will be tangent. Tangent of theta equals, uh, and uh, it will be, B goes to that side, it will be R over B times theta. All right, let me check. I think, yeah, it's R over B. R over B times theta. So that's what we're getting. That's the equation, which we need to solve <coughs> in order to find stationary points. And you know, this equation cannot be solved. It's a transcendental equation. Sounds so cool, transcendental, right? right. Um, so what can be done in this case? I remember, I think, somewhere in quantum mechanics, uh, we had, I don't remember which problem, uh, and I'm sure that, or maybe you will have, and you had it already. Right. So what is done in this case, when you cannot solve, try to get uh, some information at least graphically. So you can plot tangent theta 
and this linear function and see where are the points of intersection. Right? So search for um, solutions graphically. Right? Of course, you cannot get exactly, but in this case, one point here, yeah, we, can, we can get exact uh, value of one uh, stationary point, which, of course, you can see which one. You can see that point immediately. <coughs> okay, so let's graphically. Uh, so I will probably, still trying to estimate, uh, yeah, I will plot it here. Yeah. So let's say, no, 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 let me move it here. Because I will need space over there. So this, that, so this is theta. So first, tangent. We all know tangent function, right? Um, let me use blue. Something like that. So it will be uh, tangent. And linear function. But uh, linear function, uh, it depends on the ratio of r over b. Basically, r over b is the slope of the linear function. So the slope can be larger than 45 degrees, less than 45 degrees, right? Uh, and we know the tangent tangent at the origin. It's a, okay, at theta equals to zero, right? So Taylor expansion, theta, tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta. So the slope of the tangent at the origin is 45 degrees, 45 degrees. So if, if this slope is larger than 45 degrees, then... Uh, okay, I can plot that immediately. So if uh, r over b, <coughs> if the slope is larger than 45 degrees, then um, it's not convenient to draw over here. Okay, so in this case, okay, let me plot this, right, so it's a r over b theta uh, when r is larger than b. If r is larger than b, then that factor in front is larger than 1. Slope is larger than 45 degrees, right? And as a result, we have three stationary points. These guys, 1, 2, 3. All right, so we got that conceptually, and now we're getting semi-conceptually now, these three points. Right? Right. <coughs> so we're getting... Theta equals 0, this is theta 1, and this is minus theta 1. All right, so let me show. This is theta 1, so this point, and here we'll have minus theta 1. And of course, uh, the stationary point, which we want to analyze actually, because the question was about analyzing the stationary point, uh, this theta equals 0, the top. And this is zero, right? Okay, but but of course, when r is less than b, this factor is less than one, and the slope of this curve is less than forty-five degrees. In that case, uh, we will get the curve. These. All right. So this will be r over b theta. Uh, when when r is less than b. Okay, it, it looks ugly, this when. So, when r is less than b. So we have two situations. r is larger than b and r is less than b. So we have in one case <coughs> three stationary points, in the second case uh, only one stationary point, right? Okay, damn it, I, now I desperately need space, and I need everything. Okay, I will have to erase this part, right? I need a picture, I will probably start erasing this, because I need a function, I need these diagrams to compare, I need this. <coughs>
Okay, probably I will still uh, can summarize over here. So if if uh, R is log less than B, then one solution, right? It's a this corresponding to that case. Int, yeah, probably one solution and underneath I will write, so it's a theta equals zero, so that's the stationary point. In if R is larger than B, and then of course we have three solutions. If R is larger than B, then we have three solutions. Right, theta equals zero, and then plus minus theta one. Right. So now, <clears throat> Uh, let me check if I mention everything. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so we show that uh, yeah we are getting all the stationary points. And again, theta one and uh, theta one and minus theta one we cannot analyze because we don't know the values exactly. Of course, you need to uh, solve this equation somehow, probably numerically. All right, but not the goal. But that's not our goal. We want to analyze this uh, point zero. So, um, okay, I will put here a new bullet. Okay, let me use black, right? So, uh, so let's analyze theta equals zero for stability. Yeah, we saw it conceptually that it will be stable. Uh, under certain conditions, but now let's get it mathematically. Right, so that's our point, and so we need to look at the second derivative. So that is our first derivative. Actually, I didn't rewrite, but I can see everything, right? So let's differentiate one more time. So now, second derivative of u with respect to theta, and of course, when theta equals to zero. So. This is gone, so let me differentiate that. Oh, yeah, first of all, mg, square bracket. All right, r cosine, r cosine theta, then r theta oh, minus r theta minus r theta sine theta. So it's uh, this, and now minus b. Uh, minus b cosine theta. Minus b cosine theta. And of course, it all must be evaluated at theta equals to zero. Theta equals to zero. Right. Okay, so of course, um, I can continue over here. It is equal to this is zero, and this will be one and one. So it will be r minus b. So it will be mg r minus b. Right. Okay, so that's the value of the second derivative evaluated at theta equals zero. Right. Okay, and now we see, all right, you remember, so for a uh, stable point, second derivative must be positive. For unstable, second derivative must be negative, right? So, um, <clears throat> so it's positive for a stable point. For stable equilibrium, right? So as a result, for when r is larger than b, this r larger than b, theta equals zero is, is a stable point, stable equilibrium, right? So when r is larger than b, then theta equals zero is a stable point. And of course, the opposite situation is also true, obviously, right? So, and of course, when okay, I also need to restart the camera again. So, and if r is less than b, then of course, theta is unstable. So if the size of the cube 
is smaller than uh, diameter of the uh, cylindrical surface, then oh, what did I say, larger or smaller? Okay, let me start it from the very beginning. So if the size of the cube is smaller than the size of the diameter of the uh, cylindrical surface, then uh, the system is stable, the cube is stable. It's uh, this situation, right? So if I put this small cream box on top, yeah, I can slightly shake it, right? And it's still stable, oscillates. Okay, if I provide too much of mechanical, total mechanical energy, then of course it can slide away. But if I use this larger box, With some efforts, I can probably manage it, but because it's not ideal situation, but unstable. Right. Okay, I like this example. All right, uh, I'm not a big fan how book uh, analyzed that. Right, uh, this function, how potential energy depends on theta, is not obvious, and the book just here's the potential energy. Enjoy it, right, and let's analyze it. So I tried to use everything, the first remarkable feature, the second remarkable feature, right, except for the third one. Yeah. All right, so it's a very common um, a trick which can be used to analyze a uh, system for stability. You just write potential energy and analyze it, right? Just differentiate it once, twice, right? And of course, in your homework, you're going to do uh, something like that. And usually, of course, on the first midterm exam, there is a problem uh, on uh, where you have to use this idea. Okay, enough of this. And, and of course, again, about the problems like this. Diagram, nice picture is a must. Right? Uh, if your system is kind of complicated and I see just the function, okay, I, I have doubts that you've done it. Right? Uh, also, uh, show the reference level. So that, of course, I can sort of deduce by looking at your solution and your expression for the potential energy. I can deduce where, uh, where is your reference level is. Although sometimes I see solutions where uh, students just use two reference levels for the same system. But system can consist, for example, of two objects, right? So potential energy of one object was um, written relative to the reference level over here. Uh, for the second object, uh, reference level was somewhere, somewhere else. It's quite surprising to see that. Right? Okay, so be careful. Then. <clears throat> okay, that's uh, enough of this example, although I like it. Now, I used to discuss a different example about Atwood machine. So you know there's a pulley, right? So mass one, mass two, right? And the purpose of the second example, okay, let me sit down, right? The purpose of that uh, example is to show that in that example in the pulley, or in the case of an Atwood machine, we have tension, right? It's another force of constraints, because usually which forces of constraints do we have in our system? Normal force, friction, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> and uh, tension. In this example over here, I erase that we have two. We had two forces of constraints: normal force, which doesn't didn't play our energy game because the work is done by that force is zero, and also static friction, also force of constraints, and again it didn't play our game because it doesn't didn't do work in this case, right? And the purpose of this next example, Atwood machine, to show that even if you have a tension, which is again the force of constraints, in that case, force of constraints also uh, doesn't do work. So net work is zero. And you can easily imagine, right? So look, uh, two masses, right? So uh, if the system gets displaced, let's say in this direction, right? So work done uh, by this tension. So tension is up. Let's say we move down, right? So in this case, work will be negative. But for this mass, work will be positive, but the same in absolute value. So this, let's say, minus 5 joules here, 5 uh, joules, right? And the total uh, work done by the um, tension would be zero, right? So, uh, and after looking at this example and showing that even in this case, um, work 
done by this force of constraint is zero, then we can, we usually, I use, usually sort of generalized. So, uh, if you have a system and you have any forces of constraints, they don't play energy game. We can just simply ignore them. They just provide the trajectory. They guarantee that the system, like in this case, will move over that surface, right, without sliding. That's their work. Okay, work, right? <laughs> uh, that's their job. Right. But they don't do any work, and as a result, uh, they don't affect our energy discussion, right? So we just need to find conservative force, right, the potential energy, and only play with that potential energy. Right? But all these forces of constraints, forget about them, right? You can mention that, yeah, they are there to give us trajectory of the system, right? That to give us that particular motion. But energy approach is unaffected by the forces of constraints, right? So we can generalize here forces of constraints. Forget about them uh, when you analyze behavior of the system uh, using energy approach. <coughs> okay, so enough of this. And now, uh, okay, now I need to go back again still say a few words about this example. Look, what did we have in this system? We have an object cube. We discussed behavior of the cube, right? And this cube was exposed to uh, a conservative force, and that force is an external one, mg, right? So it is exposed to an ex external conservative force. As a result, we could, we could introduce a potential energy, mgh, right? But what if you have a system, uh, for example, of two particles isolated, they are not exposed to any external forces, two isolated particles, which move under the influence of each other. So this particle exerts force on that one, this particle exerts force on that one. And let's assume that these forces is a conservative force, are, are conservative forces. We also we can assume that they are central. And so uh, what about potential energy in this case? The situation is different now. Here, force, conservative force was an external force. And we had one object in the system. Now we have two objects in the system, and the conservative force is in, in conservative forces are internal forces. Do we have to introduce two potential energies or one potential energy? And then uh, can we, for example, use uh, conservation of mechanical energy in this case? All those questions, all those questions needs to need uh, to be answered. Because now situations is uh, sounds more complicated. So now we need to uh, address that. So now we will um, for yeah I thought I would be able to finish most likely I will finish it next class right uh, all this stuff. Now we need to discuss that case. Uh, first we need to uh, prove that uh, for the system like this of two interacting particles we can introduce only one potential energy. Um, the book goes over the derivation, and I did it once when I started teaching first time this course, I think in 2011, right? And students will, we spend like, I don't know, maybe half an hour, right? Or maybe 25 minutes, and students looking, were looking at this with the big round eyes, right? Looking at me like, are you crazy completely, right? It's a very, I don't know, I didn't like the derivation, kind of clumsy, it's so not pleasant, it wasn't pleasant at all. So after that, I decided, okay, I will no longer go through that proof. If you want, you can read the, in the chapter, right? So from that point, I just usually just write down what's the problem and what's the conclusion. Because that proof, I... Um, um, and I didn't feel like uh, that, it's, uh, that it's so crucial. Okay, so now I need to erase it. I, I feel like I'm destroying a mandala, you know, like in India, right? So monks create a mandala out of color sand, and then at a certain point they have to destroy it. So that's what I feel now. Yeah, I have a strong attachment to this. Okay, anyway, I have to erase it. So two particles isolated, so no external forces, and uh, internal forces, because now the forces between those, two, between those two particles are internal forces. All right, 
Okay, so that is section 4.9, probably I should mention if you want to read the derivation. Uh, so energy of interaction of two particles. Energy of interaction of two uh, particles. And again, I will write without W slash out, without a proof. Without a proof. So, <clears throat> um, so what should I write? So we have two particles. All right, so. Of course, we have two particles. Uh, then, uh, no external forces. System is isolated. No external forces. External forces. Uh, so, isolated system. Then, second. So, um, did I write energy of interaction? So, yeah, particles are interacting, so there are internal forces, and those internal forces are conservative and central, we're going to assume. And it's most of the time it's true, because what are the forces of interactions between our common system? Force of gravity, electric force. Both of them, central and conservative, right? So, uh, as a result, all these results can be applied to a tremendous number of systems, right? So, um, internal forces of interactions, let me write. So, internal forces of interactions. Interactions. All right, so uh, F12 and F21, and they are central and conservative. Right. So let me check what else. Ah, another statement. Of course, uh, they must obey Newton's third law. Right. So, and, and F21 equals to minus F12. So they obey Newton's third law. Right. So there are three restrictions on these forces, right? So uh, we have, yeah, so no, isolate it's important. Now about the forces, central conservative and obey Newton's third law. Okay, so now probably first I need to draw the picture. Right. So particle, I know particle two, I know particle one. So then, of course, we can have some um, reference frame. And of course, this is uh, position of that particle can be defined by the position vector R2, R1. And of course, our forces along the line connecting them. So this will be, um, okay, let me draw first a dash line. So this will be a force on uh, the second particle from the first one, you remember the subscript, the first one on which particle, the second subscript from which particle the force comes. Right. Again, in a graduate level course, all the subscripts are flipped, which drives me crazy usually. Okay. Um, so, and this will be F12, right? And of course, we can also introduce the relative position vector. Uh, right now, uh, you know, I've, yeah, I will need it. But in the next section, right, we will need it a lot. So, and then, of course, we can introduce uh, the relative position vector, R1 minus R2. Right? So the relative position vector, R, it's a R1 minus R2. Right? 
Okay, so that's what we need. And now, as I said, without the proof, yes, if you have uh, these internal forces, which obey these conditions, central conservative, obey Newton's third law, then we can introduce a single potential energy, which is the function of a, a relative position vector. Right. So in this case, yeah, <clears throat> so we can introduce a single potential energy u, which is the function of a relative position vector. And, and so now, yeah, great. So you introduce this uh, single potential, but of course there must be connection between the forces which we're trying to avoid dealing with, right? So, uh, and we introduce potential. So how can we get, for example, force F12 out of this potential? There must be. You should be able to go back and forth, right? So yes, and we can calculate um, F12 in order to find force acting on the first particle. It's a force acting on the first particle. You need to take, again, negative gradient. And of course, gradient, not of course, and the gradient must be calculated relative to the coordinates of the first particle. So the force on the first particle and gradient with respect of the coordinates of the first particle. So I will put here the subscript R1. So gradient So gradient with respect to the coordinates of the first particle. Out of this potential, u r1 minus r2. Again, if you want to see proof, go into that section and enjoy it. Right? And of course, you can see immediately how, how can we calculate f21 in exactly the same way, but now we will have a gradient with respect to the coordinates of the second particle. Yeah. Negative gradient with respect to the coordinates of the second particle and out of our single potential. Right. So that's, as I said, it took me like half an hour, or maybe, I don't remember exactly, it was what, eight years ago. <coughs> Uh, to prove that, and it was really tedious. It wasn't very pleasant at all. Okay, so that's what we need. Um, and hey, professor, uh, your volume's not working. Your mic's not. Uh, your mic's muted now. I can hear you. Why you didn't say? Yeah. I wanted just to trying to figure out if it was just me. No, 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 no. Uh, when I drink water, I usually try to mute myself right quickly, all right? And this time I forgot unmute, unmute, my, unmute <laughs> myself, right? So because it's not yeah. pleasant when you hear some serving sounds, right? Uh, drinking, right? Uh, so I'm trying to mute myself all the time in, the, in those moments. Yeah, tell me immediately, right? Don't try to figure out, right? Um, and sorry, right? Uh, so. Uh, so, what I was just saying, right, if you want to find the force acting on the first particle, you just need to take a gradient with respect to the coordinates of that first particle. If you want to find the force acting on the second particle, this F2, or F21, so you need to take a gradient, of course, negative gradient, uh, but gradient calculated with respect, a gradient of the, uh, calculated with respect of the coordinates of the second particle, right, and out of this single uh, potential. And as I, and I said, so uh, it's very tedious, right? If you want, you can uh, go to that section and read by yourself. So uh, unless I change the proof completely, right, then I might go back to the proof. But so far, I don't feel like doing it at all. <laughs> there are some crucial moments where, when derivation is important. But in this case, so far, I couldn't convince myself uh, to repeat it again. Okay, so we need this, we will need this uh, a few times in this semester, we will address this. I mean, I will, I will tell you, guys, remember, 
uh, in chapter 4, we derived that. Okay, not derived, discuss it. And so now, next, so we can, uh, for the system like this, so we can introduce a single potential. And now the question, can we use conservation of mechanical energy? If we don't have any losses, right? So if, this, if these particles uh, propagate, leave in the empty space, can we still use conservation of mechanical energy? So we need to, again, uh, go back to our what, first principle, work kinetic energy theorem, work kinetic, work kinetic energy principle, because that's what we derived from the Newton's second law. And based on that, we, we will have to go through some steps in order to prove so that even in this case, we can still use conservation of mechanical energy. Let's go through that. I will probably just start and we will finish it on Thursday. And then after that, we will just look at um, sort of a couple of uh, general examples, right, without getting into deep, uh, too, much, too deep into the example. And then it will be the end of this chapter. I thought I would be able to finish it today. And that's why I never assigned uh, the exact date for the exam. Because sometimes we can move faster, sometimes slower, right? And it's difficult to predict exactly. <clears throat> so, total mechanical energy of two interacting uh, particles. So, let me write this new uh, title. Right. Um, total mechanical energy of... Um, those two interacting particles. So these sections, two sections are connected. So first we introduce sort of potential energy, and now next step, uh, can we use the conservation of mechanical energy of two interacting particles? Right, so let me redraw this picture with some kind of trajectories, right? Because it's, uh, this picture is already, uh, has too much of information. Right, so let me draw something like, oh, too, too, big, too big, let me make it smaller. All right, so let's say particle one, particle two. Let's say this is watch one, it's uh, R1, the first particle. All right, so let's say here we have the second particle. R2. Right, R1 and R2, there is some, somewhere the, uh, the origin, right? This time I decided to skip. Of course, there will be some uh, displacement because we will have to what? We will have to calculate dW, right? Small, um, okay, work done over, work done by the force over some infinitesimally small displacement, right? So we will have to introduce the Rs. So let's say this is dr1, dr1, and this is uh, dr2. And of course, our internal forces, which still obey all these conditions. Right? So this will be F12, and this is F21, right? Internal forces. And as I said, Work kinetic energy principle, where that principle has no restrictions. You can apply it to any multi-particle system, single particle, a single particle, right? So, whatever, right? All right. So, work. Oops. Work kinetic energy principle. Work kinetic energy principle. Of course, we have to use. Ugly. All right, so for the first one, uh, let me write which way I wrote it. Okay. Um, so change in the kinetic energy of the first particle equals to the work done by force acting on the first particle, right? So this force over this infinitesimal small displacement. So, of course, it's a dot product of F12 dotted with dr1 and of course that work leads to a change in the kinetic energy of the first particle no restrictions on this so now we can do the same for the second f21 dotted with d 
R2. We know it works, no restrictions, uh, keep reminding. But now we have a system of two particles. So it means what? We have to start massaging this. So it means that now the system of two particles, naturally we need to add them up and see what we can get out of that. Because we want to connect now kinetic energies, maybe somehow we can uh, insert potential energy. So basically now we need to start manipulating. This is basically the foundation. Doesn't need any proofs. So now the change in the total kinetic energy will be d t1 plus t2, and it will be equal to f12 dot dr1 and plus f21 dotted with dr2. Okay, so from this point we will continue on Thursday. So now we just need to start applying. Newton's third law, something else than the fact that they are conservative, and and so eventually we will have to we will have to introduce uh, naturally bring this uh, mechanical oh due to the potential energy, so we, then eventually we will have to decide introduce uh, that potential energy, and as a result we will have to a change in a kinetic plus potential energy equals to zero. We'll have to end up with that. All right, but that will be on uh, Thursday. So again, what's left? Um, we will have to prove this. Then these results can be applied for elastic collision. We will just briefly, like for a few minutes, discuss that one example of collision, like a billiard balls. All right, and then rigid object. We will discuss qu quickly uh, in which, 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 uh, What's the idea about discussing rigid object again? Rigid object is a multi-particle system inside of tons of particles interacting like here, which gives us uh, tons of internal potential energy. Because again, those internal forces, right, so they obey this, as a result, we can introduce internal potential energy. How come that we never use internal potential energy? When we, when we for example, discuss the motion of this ball, right, uh, using energy approach, we only discuss external potential energy. So we will discuss that, and after that, this chapter will be over. And we will move to oscillation. So that's what we will discuss next class, and probably uh, in the second half of Plus on Thursday we will start discussing oscillations and we will be there maybe for a week and a half. Okay, that's it.